I'm going to have a little bit of a conversation with Jim and Nouriel, and then I hope that we'll have a few minutes for you to ask questions. So please get ready. And I just want to start, Jim, by uh, asking you, you know, both you and Nouriel have talked about uh, this really painful, uh, not paradox, but sort of dichotomy that we're seeing right now with rising Asia, but real decline in the West, including in America. Does that mean there's going to be a trade war? Are we going to see U.S. politicians responding with some sort of pressure on China? Well, there is. I mean, that is one way to do it. But I think the general view is that if you get into trade wars, it really hurts you in the end, and that it doesn't achieve an objective to give you an advantage. I don't think that there is anything that we can do other than look at the fundamentals. We have to get our education system better. We have to really deal with the next decade to make sure that our kids are in a position where they can be competitive with their Asian counterparts. Second thing we have to do is that we have to deal, and this is very difficult given the entitlement programs, we have to deal with our budget deficit issue. The strength of our country is being eroded as we build up our, our budget deficit. And for my money, I think you can have short-term palliatives by setting up trade barriers, but it doesn't solve the basic problem, which is that we need to take a very careful look at ourselves, stop thinking of ourselves as the dominant force in the world, and recognize that we have a lot of work to do if we're going to be competitive and if we're going to have the leading position on the planet that we want. And you've talked about deficits. How, how do you get that balance right? What you're talking about costs money. So where, you know, you've spent a lot of time in Washington. What should Larry Summers be doing? Well, I don't know how long Larry will be doing it, <laughs> but, uh, or whether he is we the can, We can have a pool <laughs> on that also. Maybe, maybe Nouriel can go back and do it uh, for a Democratic administration. But, but uh, uh, I think that you know, we have a real difficulty at the moment because our political system has become so, so antagonistic, Republicans to Democrats, that almost the national, the national focus and the national program becomes secondary to the debate between the two parties. But what is needed is for the two parties to come together and say, as a nation, we've fallen behind. The statistics that I gave, and I think that some that Nouriel gave, lead you to believe that our country is not as competitive as it was, either in manufacturing or in services or in innovation. And that is a fact. And you can't solve that by artificial trade barriers. What we have to do is to address the fundamentals and have the confidence in ourselves and have people like the audience here take the lead in terms of innovation and in terms of getting our country going. But the first thing to do is to recognize that we have a real problem and that we have to look at ourselves in real terms by comparison with other countries, notably in Asia. Now, Nouriel pointed out uh, the Japanese situation as sort of a real nightmare scenario for America. But if we think back not too long ago, people were holding up Japan as the great challenge to American power. So maybe, Jim, both you and Nouriel are incredibly short-sighted. And actually, the big Chindia threat, which we see right now, will prove as illusory as the great economic threat that Japan seemed to pose. Well, the fundamentals are very different. The Japanese uh, population is declining. Uh, the uh, population in China and India is increasing. The base is lower, and what we're looking for is a huge lift in economic activity and in terms of the creation of the middle class, first in China and then in India. We currently, globally, have two-thirds of the middle class in the G20. There are about a billion people and half a billion in Asia. Uh, by 2025, it'll be three billion in Asia and one and a half billion with us. It'll be just reversed. And we will see that the dynamics are moving towards Asia. I've said before I'm not sure that I'm going to be statistically accurate and it'll be exactly 2025 and it'll be exactly the numbers I'm giving. But directionally, I'm sure that that is correct. And most of us, and my age group, do not 
perceive the world as having changed to the degree that it really has. And I'm very worried that if the next generation doesn't do it, we will be behind yet another generation. I don't know what Nouriel thinks. He may have a more positive view. Uh, he's, he's, he's likely to be. Now, Nouriel, before you say whether you have a more positive view or not, Jim, just a minute ago, I don't know if you caught it, he has nominated you for a big job in Washington if the Democrats stay in charge. So if you were right now in the White House or in the Treasury, you've worked in Washington before, what would you be doing? And specifically, right now, would your bias be towards more stimulus or focusing on the deficit? Um, well, you know, before I get to that question on, on the first point. But that's the hard say, one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that one. But I would say on, on, on the changing kind of relative powers in the world, I think that, um, you know, we sometimes yeah, overemphasize what's going to happen with China. Uh, you know, in the 60s, uh, Germany was the rising power, and people said Germany is going to take over manufacturing in the world. Then in the 70s and 80s was Japan. Now people about, speak about, uh, you know, China and India and so on. The reality is that as per capita income rises, then wages rise, and some of the comparative advantage that China has today in some things is going to be lost. And uh, those production will be transferred to kind of other countries, so for example, in South, Southeast Asia. So the global is going to rebalance with uh, you know, economic power shifting towards China and Asia and so on. And no one is going to, unquote, uh, take over the world. But it's true also that uh, some countries or region become the centers of global economic power. And as I said, 19th century was the UK. 20th century was the US, and this century could be the Asian or the Chinese current uh, century. We'll have to see. There are many challenges in China about rebalancing growth, moving from exports to domestic consumption, from uh, regional and coastal kind of uh, growth to more internal growth, uh, dealing with the environmental damage has been done, a political transition that's going to be bumpy since an authoritarian state. But in many ways, you know, uh, China is a different challenge from uh, Japan because we're speaking about. 1.3 billion people, not uh, not about uh, you know 100 million. And secondly, Japan was uh, under the kind of defense uh, and geopolitical umbrella of the United States, while China is going to become also a rising geopolitical power with probably interests different from the United States. So those are the things we have to think about. You know, I, I don't know what I would do if I was in Washington. The reality is that in many dimensions we are running out of policy bullets. You know, uh, policy rates are zero. We already doubled base money. Banks are sitting on a trillion dollar reserves. They're not lending it because either credit demand or credit supply. If we do more QE, they're not going to lend the second trillion. If QE, not lending, quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. They're not lending the first trillion. Why would they lend the first trillion? So monetary policy is becoming impotent because it can deal with liquidity problem, not with credit and solvency problems that are at the source of the problem of the private sector. Uh, fiscal policy is also constrained. You know, there is this debate today within G G20 between fiscal austerity now or stimulating growth with more fiscal stimulus now. U.S. is in the growth now camp while everybody else is in the fiscal austerity. But even in the United States, there are limits to how much we can do more stimulus. You know, the budget deficit is a trillion and a half this year. is expected to be a trillion for the next 10 years every year. Even the U.S. cannot go from a budget deficit of 10% of the GDP to 12 to 13 to 15 at some point. The bond vigilantes would wake up even in the United States. Okay, and but say bottom line, what would you do right now? It's a terrible, hard situation. What should they do? Uh, I would say that, you know, I would do a plan of uh, medium term fiscal consolidation and maintain a stimulus in the short run. So you maintain. So another, another uh, stimulus? Well, How I would much? say as long as you can commit to reducing the budget deficit over the medium term by raising taxes and controlling entitlement spending, then you can afford in the short run to do more of a stimulus, whether it's infrastructure. Instead of uh, subsidizing, by the way, capital with an investment tax credit, I would actually have a temporary cut in the payroll tax. It's going to boost demand for labor. It's going to make labor costs lower for, for the firms. The problem in the United States is not uh, enough investment. The firms are doing enough investment. They're not hiring workers because the cost of labor is too large. So I would do a two-year payroll tax cut is funded by increasing the tax that are expiring on the, on the rich. That's something to be budget neutral and it's going to have an effect on labor demand. The big problem is jobs. We're not creating jobs and anything we can do to create jobs is going to be key because the, more, and the longer these people remain unemployed, the, lo the more they lose their skills, their human capital, and the worse it's going to be. They'll be long-term unemployed. That's the problem we're facing today. Okay, I'm going to ask Jim and Nouriel one more question and then I hope uh, you all will have a few questions to ask them. There are mics on the floor. Um, I'm looking, Jim, for a few points of light in the rather grim picture the two of you have painted. Um, and Nouriel said 
uh, one, I thought, quite optimistic thing about this idea that Africa could be the coming emerging market, that this might now finally be the moment when we see Africa taking off. Do you buy that? Well, I dearly wish I could buy that. Uh, about 16 countries in Africa will show 5% growth or better this year, which relative to recent history is enormous. But there are 53 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at the projections in terms of the future of Africa, uh, by, 2050, uh, by 2025, maybe it'll grow from 1.5% to 2% of global GDP. But by 2050, it's still around 2% of global GDP. I think Africa, which will then have a doubled population of 1.7 billion, is really a fantastic challenge, not just for the Africans, but for us. Africa used to be a place where, if you visited it, it was very contained in villages and people went out hunting and the communications were zero. That is not the case today. It is a place where cellular radios and where telephones and things are manifest and where it is part of the world. And it seems but, but to doesn't be, that point to this emerging to market phenomenon there? Well, it is, except that if you have an average per capita income, which is one-tenth the per capita income of China and India, and that itself is less than half of the per capita income in the developed world, you have two billion people that are, are not in great shape. And it worries me very much that our country, and indeed the West, pays all too little attention to Africa. And I might add, it worries me that the Africans themselves still persist in having 53 countries to run with 53 finance ministers and 53 central banks when the continent really needs to be run in terms of quartiles of the continent. And some of the leaders would like to do that, but politically it's still not possible. But Africa is a hell of a big challenge. I mean, it's very rich in natural resources. It has enormous potential and it has a growing population. Uh, but at the moment, the economy is not keeping up with the population growth. Okay, so easy answer for Africa, uh, united into either uh, United well, uh, States of Africa or maybe four countries. That, that is right not there. an easy answer, but it's one that the, Afri that the African leaders that I talk to would love to see happen and would much prefer to try and see how they can share. But you have, you have all the problems of colonialism where tribalism was was uh, disregarded and so you have countries with the wrong tribal mix and 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 you have unfortunately uh, a very poor system of governance in at least half the countries okay question please uh, yes uh, dr rubini you touched on quantitative easing uh, the money supply generally is not one of the levers in the economy that is talked about very much in terms of what we manipulate and uh, <coughs> Uh, it seems that we maybe we the government seems to be reducing the money multiplier through the new regulations on banks that restrict lending. Um, could you talk about whether uh, more quantitative easing might be worthwhile, and uh, whether we need to reform some of the bank reforms? And this is actually for both Jim and you. Okay, you gotta love it when the first question yeah. is about quantitative easing. <laughs> Go for okay. it, Muriel. Well, I mean, you point out something that's very important. We have uh, pushed down interest rate to zero. We have more than doubled base money, you know, currency in circulation, and the reserves of the banking system. Uh, so that's what's called as base money M0. But all the other monetary aggregate, M1, M2, M3, are contracting, and credit is still contracting. So as you point out, you know, there is more money in circulation, but velocity in financial market has collapsed because banks are hoarding all the excess base money, as excess reserves, they're not lending it out. Whether they are not lending it out because there is not demand for credit because borrowers don't want to borrow, or whether banks are constrained because of the new regulations that are still risk averse, or they worry about another financial crisis, or there's a credit crunch for other reasons, uh, we don't know yet, but the reality is that there is something broken with the financial intermediation system. You know. The big banks have been backstopped, but the FDIC has on its critical list 
840 banks. Uh, most of them are going to go bust. Now, each one of them is small, is not as systemically important as a Lehman or Bear Stearns, but you know, take a local bank that's financing the local town or county commercial real estate, the residential, the business, and so on. That bank uh, goes bust, and you have a mini credit crunch. You multiply it by 800, and you have a nationwide credit crunch. That's what's happening. And most of the shadow banking system has collapsed in the last few years. You know, securitization died a few years ago, has not been restored. 350 non-bank lenders have gone out of business. Season conduits are gone. Uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman, Fannie and Freddie, AIG, CIT, major institutions have collapsed or have deleveraged. So there is a significant problem in the financial intermediation system, and just printing money is not going to make much of a difference. That's the sense in which it's a credit problem, it's not a liquidity problem, it's affecting the financial markets. Okay, so what I think we get the difficulty of the situation, what's the answer? Is this just something we have to live through? You've talked about how deleveraging is something the US economy has to go through. There was a bubble before, yeah. you have to go through deleveraging. Maybe there is no solution? Uh, there's no solution in the sense that, in my view, we, we lived beyond our means and growth was below potential for a number of years because there was a massive creation of credit that was unsustainable. You know, households, financial institutions, uh, other ones. And now we have to have a hard slog of growth below trend for a while as we save more, consume less, and we deleverage. And instead, we have responded with something that was in part necessary, fiscal stimulus, that was necessary because otherwise the Great Recession would then become another Great Depression. So I'm not against that stimulus, but in some sense we're piled now on top of private debt, public debt, and again we're stealing demand from the future because at some point there'll have to be fiscal consolidation and when we start raising taxes and cut spending, growth is gonna slow down, but that's necessary. So you cannot keep on kicking the can down the road by having private debts, and then socialize them with public debts. And in countries where the sovereign now are in trouble, we have super nationals, like in Greece, bailing out now sovereign states, right? The EU, the IMF, the Eurozone. At the end of the game, who's gonna bail out the super sovereigns? There's not gonna be anybody from Mars coming and bailing out the IMF or the Eurozone. So there is this much you can do in terms of kicking the can down the road. At some point, the deleveraging of the private and public sector has to occur, so you have lower debt and you have a greater and stronger, more sustainable basis for stronger economic growth down the line. That's why I think that slow below trend growth is gonna be with us for a number of years until we deleverage. And the best we can do is to have policies that avoid something worse like a double deep recession. But I think that is unavoidable, a period of low economic growth. Okay, Jim, do you buy I, that? I agree with what uh, Nouriel said. And I think we should remember that it's, uh, it's only two years ago since we had this uh, Lehman event, uh, which brought home to us the extent of over leverage in the financial community. Two years is not a long time to put that right. And I think people are still significantly affected in the financial community by trying to ensure that they're not out of business, that they can preserve their capital, and that they can be ready for the next problems that emerge. So I don't think it's going to be a quick turnaround, and I don't think that we could have, could have in view of what happened before, it seems to me that we couldn't have expected a quick turnaround. Okay, uh, just more pain, a blood, sweat, and tears panel yeah. here. And we have getting a better. final question. It's getting better. It's it? getting better, but. Uh. Um, so my question is, um, Nuriel, you talked about um, the fact that global coordination is needed, but assuming that the governments can't get their act together and nobody from Mars is gonna come rescue us, what is the role that you think that um, global corporations that are border agnostic can play in terms of um, saving us? Uh, well, you know, I think that uh, one of the important things that I pointed out uh, that is happening in the global economy, and, uh, you know, uh, you said that, you know, I was pessimistic, but I spoke about three things that are actually positive. One is globalization is driven by global corporation. Two is the emergence of these emerging market economies. And three, there is a massive amount, as I pointed out, of technological progress that is done again by global corporations that are at the cutting edge. You know, most of it are indeed done by small, medium size, and large uh, corporations. So I think that you know, global corporations have to play their own role. Uh, one of the paradoxes is happening in the US right now is that 
corporates have become <coughs> lean and mean, right? They're sitting on almost three, two trillion dollars of cash. They've cut the labor costs massively. They've fired 8.4 million workers. And now they have to start thinking about uh, the future. They have to invest more. They have to start hire more. But Nuriel, and they have to if, take they, if they listen to you and Jim, aren't they going to yeah. invest in the emerging markets, not in the United States? Well, that's a trend that has to occur, and it's going to occur regardless of. You know, this shift in global economic power implies there will be more foreign direct investment, more investment, more growth in emerging market economies. I think that probably the corporates to do their own thing at home have to have also sound economic policies. You know, for the U.S. to become more competitive, we need to have skilled workers. We have to invest in education and skill. We have to reduce, uh, you know, healthcare costs. We have to deal with unfunded liabilities. We have to deal with uh, having infrastructure that works. So that's the role that the government can play to create an environment where the private sector is going to start hiring again, investing again, and do it both in the United States and in emerging markets. Okay, we've run out of time, but I would just like to hear from Jim. What can big multinational companies represented here with their innovative best people, what can they do to resolve this huge problem you've been talking about? Well, I think uh, they're responsible. Pay more taxes? I don't think that that's, well, I guess our government would like that to happen, but I think what is more important is to build an international workforce that understands the changes in the global economy and that allows us to compete in Asia in a way that is maybe more effective than we have done up to now. This is not to knock American corporations, but the truth of the matter is that uh, we're confronting a very serious competitive challenge in Asia by Asian companies and by Asian individuals. And uh, we need to change that. And I think that we're going against a background where the countries with which we're competing, as I look down the list in terms of their foreign exchange reserves, You've got Re People's Republic of China with 2.4 trillion, Japan at a trillion, Russia 450, Republic of China 348, India 287, South Korea 270, Hong Kong 256, Brazil 241. There are no G7 countries in that group, and you're down to number 10. So we just need to recognize in a way that I don't think we have that we've got to take a good look at ourselves, training of our people, and we've got to get out there and be able to compete on equal terms. And I hope very much that, uh, I know that companies like Google already do so, but I hope there are many more Googles to come. Thank you. Okay, well thank you very, very much.